there's a place full of species long believed extinct, where creation made laws that only apply here. A place teeming with species found nowhere else. Lord Howe Island is a unique microcosm, a garden of Eden, a collection of botanical and zoological wonders. An Eden of the South Pacific between Australia and New Zealand. It rises from the deep thousands of meters down. Created by a whim of nature, it is fragile and endangered. Only man can secure its future. Lord Howe is a paradise with changeable weather. The huge mass of Mount Gower soars from the sea to a height of almost 900 meters. It draws approaching storm clouds like a magnet. Seven hundred kilometers off the coast of New South Wales, the weather can change from one moment to the next. Storms come and go and sometimes stay, clinging grimly to the rocks of the island. Even underwater, they feel the swell. Wind and waves release huge forces, even down here. Everything is moving. The sea creatures seek shelter. Any fish that can finds a nook or cranny. Even 30 meters down, the swell shifts the seabed. Only a few, like this double header, are still on the lookout for prey. The storm seems undecided as to whether to break in full force. Suddenly the clouds part and the sun breaks through. But the strong winds have damaged the white tern colony. Helpless, the parent birds flutter over their nesting places. This three-week-old chick is fighting for its life. It might survive the four-meter fall, but on the ground its chances would be slim. White terns do not build nests. On the bare branches, their eggs and young are at the mercy of the elements. Whenever there's a storm, Ian Hutton is out in it. Nothing will keep him at home, because he knows that his white terns, his children, need his help. The birds of Lord Howe Island are what gives Ian's life meaning. They're why he left the comforts of life on the mainland 25 years ago. The mother has returned with food for her young. She watches the interfering stranger suspiciously. But Ian knows the parents won't reject the baby, even though he has touched it. The mother approaches carefully, and as soon as the chick smells the fish, it forgets its fear and the storm. This chick is not the only victim. The white terns only came to Lord Howe in the 1950s, when the Norfolk pines were planted. The trees are their favorite nesting places. Why, no one knows, as every storm claims its victims. Seeking shelter, fallen birds move further and further away from their parents. Knowing that the fallen baby birds will not survive unaided, Ian takes them to the Wilson family to be looked after until they're ready to fly. With great powers of persuasion, empathy and infinite patience, and above all, with his books, Ian has succeeded in raising the islanders' awareness of their unique animal and plant world. 
For a long time, nature's abundance was taken too much for granted on Lord Howe, which is why Ian fights to save every baby bird. Parents may come back or may not, so rather than have it starved there, brought it down here to Camel, and every year he raises about 10 of these little birds. So these ones have been here about a month. And we'll just add this one here to the lot, and uh, he'll be hand set every day. And he should survive. The weather is changing again. The wind is now buffeting the island at more than 80 kilometers an hour. Birds that haven't found shelter must be careful. Within minutes, the storm can blow up to cyclone force. In the sea, too, the storm is raging. A sea urchin is dislodged by the strong swell. The double header picks up the tumbling movement. If the urchin lands with its unprotected stomach facing upward, it won't have a chance. The double header isn't the only one interested. But the moray eel takes over only when the doubleheader's more powerful jaws have broken the urchin open. The brightly coloured coral fish are scavengers. They too want their share. The double header becomes more aggressive, and the moray eel gives in. In less than a minute, it's all over. All that remains is a hollowed out skeleton. The ever hungry double header moves on to the coral and algae. An omnivore found only in the waters of Lord Howe Island. It is perfectly adapted to this tiny ecosystem. The feast is soon over, and so is the storm. Suddenly, Lord Howe shows its other face, paradise set on an ancient volcano. Mount Gower rises nearly 3,000 meters from the sea floor. But it has been a loser in the struggle between wind and waves. What you see today is only a fraction of what was once a huge island. Millions of years of erosion have reduced it to about a fortieth of its original size. All over the island, strange rock formations stand like wounded soldiers, raising their twisted forms to the sky. In the course of a few million years, a brief moment in the history of the Earth, the huge massif of Mount Gower disappeared. But the disappearance of the massif left behind a unique habitat on the mountain plateau. A fairy tale forest, a magic garden cut off from the Earth's history. Over a hundred plant species are found only in this lonely forest. The rare flightless wood hen survives only here. And this is where 20,000 Providence petrels gather for their annual mating ritual. As a World Heritage Site, Lord Howe Island enjoys unique protection. Just 400 islanders live here, mostly descendants of the first five families who settled on the island 150 years ago. And there are the tourists, limited by agreement with UNESCO to a maximum of 400 per day. 
both man and nature seem to have withdrawn from the outside world. Other rules apply here. It's one of the few places in Australia where children can still go to school barefoot. The children also design the island's phone book and every islander's nickname is included. Everything has its own rhythm. Lord Howe time. The island is a legend. The mere mention of the name Lord Howe is enough to fill many Australians with a yearning to go there. But the limit on visitor numbers makes it an exclusive destination, full of surprises. Many well-known species are found in unusual forms here. Above and below the surface. Here you enter a strange world. The clownfish, star of Finding Nemo, is usually orange and white. Here there is a different species. The Lord Howe clownfish is black and white. This looks like a perfectly normal coral reef. But coral reefs are not usually found this far south. It's too cold. Even so, countless tropical species live among the strange structures that ring the island. Right next to the reef, there are algae and sponges found only in cold water. Two different worlds are side by side. Several currents from the South Pole and the equator ensure that two completely different habitats meet off Lord Howe, tropical and cold waters. The fish move between the two worlds. Species that normally never meet come face to face on the southernmost coral reef in the world. The storm is not yet over, but the work can't wait. Ian Hutton takes ornithologist Darren Peck to Muttonbird Point, nesting place of the muttonbirds, or shearwaters. Well hidden under the long grass on the cliff, the chicks await the return of their parents. Darren is one of many researchers who keep coming back to study the island's unique uh, bird life. 38.7. Ian's help is essential. On their own, strangers would take days to find the birds. And the, wind is the chicks are weighed, measured and checked three times a week. Their growth is monitored because shearwater numbers are declining. At the same time, masked boobies are reproducing at a great rate. Even though this is mutton bird point, the masked boobies now dominate its nesting. The delicate balance has been upset. Ian was the first to study the behavior of the boobies. He knows their partnership rituals, which bolster a couple's lifelong relationship. And he found out why the boobies are living in what was the mutton bird's home. An apparently insignificant human action has destroyed the habitat of one of these species. This native grass was growing all over Mutton Bird Point until 1948 when somebody planted Kaikuyu grass and that spread over most of the point which has benefited the masked booby. They can nest on it more densely but the poor shearwaters that used to nest here, they can't nest here anymore because the kaikuyu, the introduced grass, 
that chokes their burrows. The elegant parents accompany the still awkward young boobies on their maiden flight. An idyllic picture. However, the balance has been upset. These problems are found all over Lord Howe, wherever humans have carelessly intervened. Lord Howe Island was discovered in 1788. Forty years later, five families gradually settled here. Their persistence on their isolated island is amazing. In the early decades, they often went hungry. To this day, their descendants determine the island's fate and defend it against newcomers. Until the mid-1970s, there was little contact with the outside world. They often had to wait weeks for the supply ship. Despite aircraft and telecommunications, the fear of being cut off still lingers. So the islanders have bought a cargo ship. It comes every two weeks, bringing food ordered by phone from supermarkets on the mainland. From cement mixers to desks, cars to pencils, virtually everything on Lord Howe Island comes on this ship. But the construction of the new jetty changed the bay. The wooden piles have attracted giant shoals of catfish. Shoals provide safety in numbers against predators. And the jetty has brought plenty of predators too. Stingrays are attracted by waste from the jetty. A catfish would be a tasty snack, but there isn't much here today, and the giant ray takes his leave. Most people don't notice the changes underwater. Who knows what shellfish, seaweed or plankton have come to the island via the hull of the supply ship. Any contact with the outside world could lead to the collapse of the island's fragile ecosystem. Visitors above the water are much easier to identify. In 1918, a stowaway came to Lord Howe Island. Over the side, or in a crate, it doesn't matter, but nothing has been the same since. Within a few years, nine bird species had disappeared. Humans played a part in it too. They had no idea that the birds were just the first to leave the island forever. The rats gorged themselves on the unprotected eggs and nestlings. Then they started attacking the flora. Their favorite food was the fruit of the Kentia palm. The failure to deal with the intruder became such a problem that the islander's livelihood was at stake. Dean Hiscox is a fisherman, diving instructor and national park ranger. In the season, he's also a Kentia harvester, the toughest job on the island. At up to $1,600 a day, it's also the best paid. But after three days of shinning up and down trees, Ocker, as he's known, needs at least three days rest. The Kentia palm was once unique to the island, and it's still vital to the island's economy. From Lord Howe Island, the palm has gone to living rooms all over the world. Small Kentia palms are popular pot plants. If it weren't for the palm exports, 
many islanders would have to leave. It takes seven months for the seeds to germinate and nurseries have been set up to meet the demand. Annette Thompson works in one. Under her supervision, 600,000 seeds a year are planted here. They are nurtured in special germ-free soil. In the greenhouses, protected from rats and other pests, 90% of the seeds germinate. But until then, Annette has to keep a constant eye on the tiny seeds. When the seedlings are the right size to be shipped, it has to be done quickly. They arrive in greenhouses in Europe and the United States within 48 hours, either to be sold or to be further grown. Every inch of storage space is used. They are packed quickly and efficiently. It's only when the plane leaves that Lord Howe time takes over again. The rhythm of nature never stops. On Mount Eliza, the red-tailed tropic birds are starting their courtship flights. The male's mating ritual includes circling, soaring and manoeuvring in front of his chosen female. In order to keep her interest, he has to do it over and over again because thousands of rivals are waiting for their chance to attract the females. Tropic birds breed in greater numbers on Lord Howe than anywhere else, yet it's still hard for Ian to get a photo. The nests are hidden in inaccessible niches in the cliffs. The larger the chicks are, the more aggressively they beg for food. The birds, so elegant when they fly, are clumsy when they walk. The walk from the nest is a balancing act. Every view on Lord Howe Island is of a different bird territory. Every bird species has its own territory, but they all compete for food. That is where specialisation comes in. At low tide, when parts of the sea floor are exposed, the beach teems with small, agile birds. There's plenty of food here. The ruddy turnstones have evolved their own feeding techniques and are very successful. Other birds are less skillful, but they may still find some leftovers. or they might steal from a careless relative. It has been difficult for the human residents too, since Lord Howe Island was declared a World Heritage Site. Many children will have no future on the island. The strict rules mean that no new houses may be built. Ruby, Anna and Nathan will probably have to leave. Ian is fighting for these children. He often goes to the reef with them at low tide. He wants to help them understand what conservation means and make them enthusiastic about it. Look, what's there, a baby sea urchin? There's one. A very small one. By touching and feeling things, the children learn to understand the natural wonders of their island home. Ian is pleased to see how happy the children are when they touch a sea urchin, starfish or sea cucumber. Twelve-year-old Ruby is full of enthusiasm. Ian is glad to answer all the curious questions. Yet he himself is a victim of the restrictive conditions. He has no permanent home. And this may mean that as a newcomer he will have to leave the island, even after 25 years. 
The sea hare is a kind of sea slug, one of many species around the islands. Lacking a shell, it relies on camouflage for protection. The Spanish dancer, a 20 centimeter sea snail, has another strategy. It feeds on poisonous seaweed. It is itself immune to the poison, but deters predators by storing it in its body. Even its eggs are poisonous, so they can be exposed to the current without protection. Other species protect their eggs devotedly. The reef ocean perch constantly swims around them, creating a current that maximizes their oxygen supply. It isn't easy for the corals to survive in the world's southernmost reef. Not only do they face storms and cold currents, but also their worst enemy has followed them here from warmer waters. The crown of thorn starfish creeps from coral to coral. When it comes to a polyp, its stomach puffs out through its mouth, covers the polyp, and begins to eat it alive. All it leaves behind is the bleached limestone skeleton of the victim. Large numbers of crown of thorn starfish have been turning up in recent years. Is this also because of human activity above and beneath the water? The flowers also provide plenty of puzzles for scientists. At first sight, Lord Howe is a sea of flowers, but there are drawbacks. Most of the flowers are introduced varieties that are driving the native flowers out. Ian Hutton is fighting on this front too. The island has 348 human residents and about 220 introduced species. Of those, 17 are weeds that spread rapidly, crowding out all the other plants. God, it's up. Ian mobilizes tourists for his campaigns. They sacrifice their holiday for this paradise at the end of the earth. And it is working. The flora and fauna on the tiny islands around Lord Howe have not been affected. The islands are still a refuge for rare and exotic creatures. The black Lord Howe cockroach was perfectly adapted until the island was invaded by rats and humans. Over time, it had lost its wings and its legs evolved into stumps. Its body shape became rounder and more solid in contrast to that of its unpopular relative, the domestic cockroach. With no predators, it had no need to run away. Well camouflaged, the Lord Howe gecko awaits its prey. He isn't interested in cockroaches. He'll find smaller, tastier insects in the undergrowth. The most famous creature lives on the archipelago's remotest and most spectacular island, Ball's Pyramid. It stands 551 meters above the sea. It was thought there was nothing on it but a few stunted tea trees. But under these bushes, scientists found the well-preserved skin of an insect that was believed extinct decades ago. Curious, the men climbed higher. And at the next bush, a relic from the age of the dinosaurs came towards them, as if waiting to be discovered. A bizarre stick insect, almost 15 centimeters long. This could only happen on Lord Howe. Just 24 of the insects were found. Scientists captured two breeding pairs and began an elaborate breeding program, although no one knew what the insect ate or when it mated. Their numbers have now almost trebled. 
and the scientists can now tell the male from the female. Ball's Pyramid must be the loneliest spot in Australia. It is where the warm and cold ocean currents meet. Food is plentiful, and not just for the plankton-eating manta rays, almost six meters long. Many sharks are also attracted by the shoals of small fish that feed on the plankton. The sharks are always on the prowl. Small fish gather in elegant formations, seeking refuge in the crowd. It's only a matter of time until the sharks attack. And hunters are waiting near the surface as well. The strong currents have created a complex system of underwater caverns, huge labyrinths where the sea has created a new habitat. Some creatures never leave these caves. Others hide in holes and only venture out to mate or to feed at night. When the sun sets, the stick insect on Ball's Pyramid appears on the only bush that can survive on the storm-buffeted rocks. It only eats the leaves of this bush. And, of course, this is a special variety of tea tree that only grows in the Lord Howe archipelago. Marine creatures have developed all sorts of strategies to protect themselves at night. But things are a little different on Lord Howe. The parrotfish usually spins itself a cocoon of mucus to keep its predator, the black tip shark, from getting its scent. But there are no black tips here, so the parrotfish can sleep unprotected. Other creatures are extremely careful. This decorator crab covers itself in such a coating of algae and sponges, it is almost undetectable. If it goes elsewhere, it has to change its camouflage. At night, a false move can be fatal. Many hunters are on the lookout. The lionfish spreads its poisonous spines while it waits to snap up its prey. The trumpet fish floats like a leaf for hours, waiting for the right moment. The frogfish is perfectly camouflaged. A poor swimmer, it melts into its surroundings. Then it crawls along the seabed on fins like tiny feet. Then it attacks so quickly that its victim doesn't notice a thing.
But something unusual is happening on this March night. A new cry pierces the darkness. At twilight, the first Providence petrels land on the Mount Gower Plateau. They have flown tens of thousands of kilometres. This is their only nesting place in the world. Right away, they start building their nests. The weather on Lord Howe forces them to. Only nesting places on small hills are safe. The frequent rain regularly floods the caves lower down and would endanger the chicks. Once claimed, the nest is defended against all comers, even if there's not yet any mate. Of course, the arrival of the Providence petrels has not gone unnoticed down at the foot of Mount Gower. The birds' cries fill the air. Many have already flown around the mountain in the early evening. Ian Hutton has been waiting for this for months. At first light, he sets out on the four-hour climb up Mount Gower. He passes the Norfolk Pines and the White Tern Colony, more peaceful in the calm weather than it was on his last visit. Pairs of birds spend the night huddled together for warmth. There's not much room in the trees, and the birds are very conscious of one another's territory. Ian believes that couples sleep on the same spot, on the same branch, year after year. The mating season lasts until spring. Lord Howe is now a paradise for the white tern, a species increasingly endangered worldwide. There are now more than 200 breeding pairs, and all of them have to find shelter in the few Norfolk pines. Like this one, White terns are quite willing to take advantage of any finds on the beach, but usually they catch and eat their prey on the wing, far out over the sea. The rest of the colony is still setting out for the daily hunt. After half an hour, Ian reaches the woods at the base of Mount Gower. Almost straight away, he hears a sound unique to Lord Howe Island. A step a breaking branch, and the wood hen is alert. Unlike most birds, the wood hen reacts to a disturbance by defending its territory, even against Ian. The greater the noise, the more determined the wood hen becomes. Like so many island birds, the wood hen has lost the ability to fly. A bird that doesn't fly doesn't have to eat so much. A sensible strategy in an environment without predators. But it also made them an easy catch for the first settlers, for whom the wood hens were a delicacy. The settlers' cats, dogs and pigs made short work of the eggs and chicks. Barely 30 birds survived, all of them on the Mount Gower Plateau. Then came the world's most successful reproduction program. First, three pairs were bred in captivity. The eggs were hatched and the fledglings were released. Rangers laid poisoned rat traps to protect the eggs and chicks. Now there are almost 300 birds and they are carefully monitored. Every autumn, the rangers set out with huge nets and special whistles that imitate the territorial call of the wood hen. They are counting the wood hen stocks. The wood hens are used to it. But that doesn't mean they like it. They've grown shy. So when they're suddenly surrounded, things have to go very quickly.
The birds are weighed in air-permeable, coarse-grained linen bags. The rangers catch every bird at least once a year. A database analyzes every change in size and weight, no matter how small. The rangers use a system of different colored bands to tell whether, when and where a bird has been caught before. There is probably no animal species in the world whose behavior has been analyzed as much as that of the wood hen. But that is why the program has been so successful. The birds have now spread all over the island. Things are looking good for the wood hen, the symbol of the island's unique natural world. At least one would think so. But once the biological balance has been upset, the problems just don't stop. There's now a new problem. This is a rail, a relative of the wood hen. It's the same size, but a lot more agile, and was introduced by man. While it's not an enemy, it does compete for exactly the same resources. This little chick's only one or two days old. They've still got the egg tooth on there. And that'll drop after, after a couple of days. This is one of the birds that's benefited from the move to get rid of cats off Lord Howe Island. When cats are removed, these birds are able to increase all through the settlement area. And uh, other birds have too, but this is probably the most notable of the birds on Lord Howe that has increased since cats have gone. Because there are still too few wood hens, the rails are winning the race to breed. They breed faster, and they've adapted better to humans. As yet, no one knows how to stop them. Ian can't miss the chance to photograph this spider. After 25 years of research, he's still surprised at the diversity of species on the island. After an hour and a half, Ian reaches the so-called lower road, the track along this 400-metre basalt wall carved out by the wind and waves. Since a recent landslide, the track has been marked with ropes. The rock is slippery. Clouds and mists appear constantly. The extreme humidity at the top of Mount Gower makes climbing unpleasant, but is essential for the unique plant life. The only ecosystem similar to this one is on the slopes of mountains in East Africa. At the top are five streams, no more than a few hundred metres apart. For Ian, it's just a few steps from one creek to the next, but for some of the creatures in them, they are barriers they can never cross. Under the water, it's like another planet. Each stream is an isolated microcosm. Each stream has its own species of snail. They will never meet their neighbors in the next pool. Another water animal has evolved in its own way. The caddisflies move between worlds. Only their larvae live underwater. They leave the water to mate. They have now spread all over the mountain. The larvae live on the leaves that drop from the primeval forest. Shrimp have ended up here too, another Lord Howe puzzle. The freshwater shrimp live in the not very extensive waters of the streams. No one knows how they got here. Eels have made their way up here as well. They work their way up the mountain streams from the sea. If necessary, they can even cover short distances on land. 
Up here, 600 meters above sea level, they face no predators and there is an unlimited supply of food. After climbing for three hours, Ian has a clear view of the summit and of the gathering petrels. Every hour there are more. This is a crucial point in the climb, a vertical rock face 20 meters high. For many intruders, it is an insuperable obstacle. No feral pig could climb this natural barrier. This unique natural world was saved from the omnivores by a whim of nature. The rocky barrier, almost 700 meters above sea level, provides the last view of the island before the entrance to the high plateau. Here, the terrain is suddenly flatter. Ian has reached the first of the four plateau levels. The further he goes, the more the vegetation changes. The number of endemic species increases with every meter of height. 40% of the plant varieties on the plateau only grow here, on an area the size of 35 football fields. If these plants were dug up and taken down to sea level, they would die in a few days. They have survived in the humidity for thousands of years, each with its own strategies. This fern has two different kinds of leaf. The broad ones photosynthesize sugar and starch to feed the plant. The narrow ones are for reproduction. This yellow fork fern is one of the oldest plants on Earth. It was around long before our ferns and the dinosaurs took over the world. Ian has found just 40 specimens since 1980. He now records GPS data for every new discovery so that he can monitor their growth. On this plateau, there's a great deal for the plant lover. Every time he comes here, Ian is captivated by its beauty. He even forgets his actual goal, the Providence petrels. In the magic world of the peak, it's easy to forget about time and objectives. Only the cheeky Karawongs distract him until he discovers the next treasure. This is one of the beautiful mosses on the top of Mount Gower. There's 105 moss species up here because of the cloud forest and the constant high humidity. And this group of uh, mosses, the Dorsania group, they're amongst the tallest mosses in the world. It certainly is the largest moss here on Morton Island. Many of the plants found in such abundance up here are endangered. The small mountain palm only grows here. It was almost extinct because its fruit was a favorite with rats, which ate the seeds before they ripened. So much rat poison is now used on the plateau that the palm can reproduce once more for the first time in almost a hundred years. The screeching is getting louder. In the afternoon, the Providence petrels return from their sea hunt. From their thicket hideouts, they express their indignation at the presence of a human interloper. Ian makes calls of his own. The noise makes the petrels inquisitive. They aren't at all fearful. 
Ian's first calls bring them out to investigate. More and more birds come out, and a unique spectacle begins. Providence petrels are very aggressive. They fight for every inch of territory. More than 20,000 of them will live on this small plateau for the next few months, and they'll attack whenever they hear a noise. Sometimes Ian thinks he hears a different cry, a special pitch, or that he sees other plumage colours. Then he follows the birds to their burrow, ignoring the snapping beaks, and fights his way through the undergrowth. He is looking for the legendary Kermandic, another species of petrel that was killed off by rats years ago. Could there be a few left? Despite all the studies, have some survived somewhere in the masses of other species? Ian dreams of rediscovering them. It would be another chapter in his book of natural wonders on Lord Howe Island.